This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. We're back. We're live with ThinkTech. <laughs> <laughs> And today uh, we're going to do, uh, I guess it's Community Matters, and we're going to talk about immigration because it's, it's appropriate to examine the history of immigration when we talk about all these new initiatives and you know, restrictions and bans and what have you, um, to understand where this country has been on immigration. And for this purpose, we have John David Ann, and he's professor of history at Hawaii Pacific University. And while he knows so much about these kinds of things, you have to look at everything through your term, the lens of history, John. Exactly, exactly, Jay. Good to be here. Good to have you. So let's talk about the history <laughs> yeah, of immigration sure. in this country. Okay. It didn't take too long. For a melting pot, right. back in the early 19th century, right, it didn't right. take too long before people started to get exclusive again. That's yeah? true, that's true. First of all, it's never been quite a melting pot. That's a common term. But, uh, you know, uh, historians who have studied this go, well, actually, that didn't happen at all. Um, there were really was very little melting, actually. It's going to be the final exam. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> some, some historians or some pundits have used the term salad bowl, where, you know, the people didn't really mix together. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't work that well either. The thing is, especially in the late 19th, early 20th century, when immigrants came to the United States, they carried their culture and their life ways with them. They didn't really, I mean, um, largely they became patriotic Americans, uh, but culturally they kept their customs, uh, they kept their ways of doing things, their connection to their local communities and their institutions. For instance, the Catholic Church for, for uh, South, uh, South European immigrants was terribly important. And it, it was something they brought with them from the old world. And so uh, it's not, it's never been melting. No, it's true. And yeah. I grew up in yeah. Queens, New York. Oh my my block, my yeah. block was Jewish yeah. block. Yeah. The next block was the um, was the Irish block. Yeah. And the one down from there was the Italian block. And you know, as a as a little kid, you didn't go on the other yeah. block. You stayed on your block. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a modern city, right? Wow. But that's, but it was uh, it was yeah. not really yeah. a melting pot. It was no. block by block. Right, right, right. right. And there, of course, there there have been tensions, right? Um, and that's its own story. You know, the tensions of of between older immigrants and newer immigrants, between uh, Western European immigrants, kind of the Anglo-Saxon immigrants, and the immigrants considered to be uh, lesser than. There was this strong ethnocentrism in the United States at the turn of the century when you had all kinds of Italian and uh, Eastern, you know, Southern and Eastern European immigrants coming in. Uh, old line Americans, Anglo-Saxons, looked at them and thought, these people, they're, they're clearly not, they're clearly inferior to us. Unwashed so, masses. Yes, exactly. And, and so uh, there's, there's, comp there's, labor competition, uh, and not between Anglo-Saxons and Italians, but between, between Italians and Irish and African-Americans. Um, and, and mobility was hard. Mobility was very hard. You got stuck in the, uh, say, the Lower East Side ghetto of Manhattan. Um, it was hard to break out of that. Yeah, there was, I mean, there was, you know, those low-wage jobs, the unskilled jobs were very poor pay. Uh, you probably lived in a, if you lived in the New York City area, you probably lived in a tenement, yep. which was essentially a structure that was built on the back of one of these nice brick buildings. <laughs> and it, it had maybe one toilet for three floor, three or four floors. Um, you had, you know, no running water. Uh, and uh, it was you know, a fire trap. Too. It was, yeah. I mean, it was heated with you know these uh, old stoves that you know could blow up, and you know you'd have big fires. So yeah, it was it was a pretty terrible existence for some of these immigrants. So, so yeah. I mean, the history of American immigration is very interesting, especially when you consider it in the current situation. So what we can do is we can we can see the current immigration uh, issue, which was really kind of anti-immigration uh, because of Donald Trump and the Trump administration's uh, focus on immigration as a bad thing, 
which is, you know, it's like actually the, the, the last half of the 20th century, or at least since 1965, immigration was thought to be a good thing yeah. that enhanced uh, well, what did the I United ask you States. about that? So you, you had yeah. the Exclusion Acts of the late 19th century and the early 20th century, right, right. but Karen Walters in there in the right. 1920s. We'll, we'll, get, we'll come back and we'll talk about that history. But, but, yeah. but I thought, I thought at yeah. some point the country hit a kind of positive note. Yes, Maybe it was it's that true. Reference That's you made right. In, in 1965, yeah. uh, uh, Congress passed the Hart Seller Immigration Act, in it, which really opened up immigration. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it was still based upon uh, skill, and uh, but it was primarily based upon families. If you had a family member in the country, then uh, relatives could come fairly easily. Uh, and this was in part because of uh, the immigration in the in the time period before that was really focused on these old line Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, Great Britain, Germany, uh, less so from France, and so with quotas, exactly, and and so these these second generation immigrants from Greece, from Italy, from Eastern Europe, they were bitter about this. They didn't like this because they couldn't bring their their fam their extended families. The, quote, the quota for those countries was way lower. Oh, yeah. you, you could never get you know so many from Greece in the country. So so they appealed to the Kennedy administration. And so in some ways you can see it as a part of the civil rights movement, enhancing freedom, enhancing the ability yeah. to, to come to this country. So uh, 1965, things opened up. And since that time, you've had immigration policy that's been quite open. It's been attacked by right-wingers for quite some time. They've not liked this. Now they, ha they finally have a president who thinks like them who thinks, actually, we should close this down. We should cut immigration in half. We should actually go away from family-centered immigration to the skills-based immigration. And that's, you know, that's really all we need, and, and we should really limit the number of immigrants. So, so you've got this, currently you've got what is a, a, a president who is playing on, on anti-immigrant sentiment. Uh, actually, that was a big part of the reason why he won the election. And how close is that to old-fashioned bigotry? Right. So, so let's you know, it's oh, it is. But let's look back at the at the history of this and yes. uh, and so so the history of immigration and then anti-immigrant movements. Yes. It's actually it's hand in hand. <laughs> you have a big immigration, and then you have an reaction. upsurge in anti-immigrant feelings. So it's a sign curve with it's, reaction it's, all the it's time. It's <laughs> unbelievable. So it's very consistent in history. So, so the first big immigration we have is in the, uh, pardon me, the 1830s, and in the, especially in the 1840s, then after the potato famine, in Great Britain and in Ireland especially then, there's a big immigration of Irish to the United States in the 1840s, uh, millions. And uh, sure enough, by the 1850s, old line Americans have organized, they create a, a secret society called the Know Nothings. Oh yeah. Yes, and they create a political party called the Native American oh. Party. Yes, and it has nothing to do with those Native Americans. You know what this popped up in the gangs of New York? Exactly, that movie. exactly. It's a yes, wonderful yes. movie. It's, well, it's a very violent movie. Yes. Um, and it's an exaggeration of what's going on. But there are, in fact, in New York City, there are, in fact, Irish and nativist gangs fighting it out on the streets of New York and in, in, in where Wall Street is today, you know, it's, it's the southern reaches of Manhattan. And what you're seeing right now is actually a flag the flag of the Native American Party, which ran in every state in the Union in the is early that, 1850s. That right? is That's that correct. Right? And they won elections in Massachusetts and in Maine. They did pretty well in some parts of the South and the Midwest. For a short period of time, the Know Nothings, and again, this is the Native American Party, the Know Nothings were very successful. Uh, and they captivated former Whigs. They were actually, believe it or not, somewhat anti-slavery and nativist. How do you like that? You know, they, okay. <laughs> it's very so strange. Anybody that strange it was on their bad list. Yes, but, <laughs> but they were anti-slavery as well. Mm -hmm. So they were against, 
Well, maybe it's they were slave. Saying, uh, maybe they're saying they didn't like the slaves. Well, yeah, I mean, I think as immigrants. part of it part of it is that you're in the 1850s. The question is, are you going to allow slavery into the new territories, into new territories gained okay. during the Mexican War? Right. And uh, right. Uh, and so those who are opposed to this, they're not necessarily abolitionists. They don't really like African Americans. They don't want not in my backyard. Exactly. They don't want African Americans in these in these slaves in these new territories. Yeah. So that's true. That's that's, that, that's worse. Actually, it, it lines up. That's that's a good point. It does line up with the the anti-immigrant feeling. But so that party is very strong for a few years, and then in the mid 1850s, then Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party emerge. And they actually pull a lot of voters away from the know-nothings because they settle on a moderate anti-slavery platform. But they're, the anti-slavery can go several different ways. It can go abolitionist anti-slavery. It can go moderate anti-slavery. Really don't like slavery in the South, but definitely don't want it to spread. Uh -huh. Not going to touch slavery in the South, but just don't want it to spread to uh -huh. the new areas because it degrades free labor. It's bad for the economy. Yeah. It, it's it's, uh, it's a it, competition it's, argument. It's, yeah, it's, it's counter to American values of industry and thrift and, yeah. and productivity. Um, and then you have the kind of the right-wing part of the anti-slavery uh, movement, and those guys, they just don't like African Americans. They don't want African American slaves to be in their backyard. That, so the Republican Party has a big tent, and they cover all of those anti-slavery folks. And uh, So interesting that the moderate yeah. ones you mentioned, if that had been the rule, if they had prevailed somehow, that might have avoided the Civil War. They did prevail. Abraham Lincoln was right there in the center of this anti-slavery uh, wing, anti-slavery Republican Party. He was there in the middle. He said, you know, it's against American values. It's, we'll, we'll accept it in the South. We're not going to change it in the South, but we don't want it to spread. Oh, how interesting. Now, Lincoln— And he would not, he would not have started the Civil War himself. They started it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> he claimed again and again after his election that he was not going to touch slavery in the South. But, but Southerners didn't believe him. They believed that he was a John Brown in secret. He was a secret abolitionist, and he was going to destroy slavery. But interesting, Lincoln was, he hated the know-nothings. Uh, Lincoln made a statement to the effect, this is a paraphrase, that um, if we're going to have a political party that excludes uh, people of, from different origins, uh, we may as well have our, our totalitarianism and authoritarianism with, without any cover of innocence and move to imperial Russia, <laughs> okay. which, which was a totalitarian, authoritarian yeah. place where, you yeah. know, people— You knew exactly what you were getting there. <laughs> exactly. You, know, you didn't want the cover of, you know, of, of nice words about equality and freedom and the rest of it. So Lincoln was actually very sensitive to the immigration issue, and he was in favor of it. Uh -huh. Uh, he believed that it brought industry and productivity to the country. So, so yeah, that's yeah, the fair. first major reaction to this big influx of immigrants in the 1830s and the 1840s. Yeah, but you say big influx in the 1830s and 40s and gangs in New York and all that. Right. <clears throat> By the time we got to 1880 and 1890, that big influx looked really small. Exactly. Because now it was huge. Exactly. Exactly. And right so. after this break, John, okay. we're going to examine okay. how huge it was and okay. why the reaction was different. Okay. That's John Davidan. He's a history professor at, at HPU, and we're talking about immigration in this country because we need to know about the history of it to understand, or at least try to understand, what's going on now. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey. Spend the time with us as we look through and discover all of the ins and outs of this journey through life. We're on Wednesdays at 11 a.m., and I would love to have you with us. Come navigate the journey. Aloha. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here at the Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, 
I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe in real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all that great stuff. Thank you. Okay, we're back. We're live with John David and history professor at HPU talking about immigration in America. Uh, wow, here on Community Matters. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so in the 1880s, and I'm guessing you'll have to correct me, yeah. 1885, 1890, you know, all that 20 year period or uh, the brown decades, as Lewis Mumford called it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, things were Victorian in many ways, but at right, the same time, right. the ships were laden with new immigrants and they were coming in left and right, so much so that they had to build structures like Ellis Island exactly, in order to exactly. handle all these people. That's right. There had to be reaction. What was the reaction? Right. So, so you have between 1880 and 1940, you have almost 40 million immigrants oh. coming into the United States. There are some parts of the country where uh, uh, first generation immigrants dominate, like uh, Chicago. Two thirds of the population of Chicago is first generation immigrant in 1900. Ah. So uh, it's a very powerful force. And uh, <clears throat> so early on you have, uh, you have uh, uh, progressives in this time period from 1900 on uh, to about to the time period of World War I, 1914. Progressives are approaching immigrants as people with alien, cult uh, alien cultures and you know, languages who need to be educated in the ways of America, a so-called campaign of Americanization, uh -huh. right? So, so, and it's innocent. You imbue them with American ideals, you teach them English, you teach them how to be patriotic. No problem. And in fact, some some progressives actually worked to protect immigrant interests. Uh, there was research into you know why immigrants didn't get jobs, and you know there was the treatment of immigrants. There was some of that, but this all changes in World War One. World War One breaks out in 1914, but it's it's Germany against you know Great Britain and France, and in Germany becomes quite evil in the eyes of Americans. And by the time the United States enters the war, then German immigrants in the United States are considered very suspect. Spies. Possibly spies, but certainly not Americans. Sympathizers. Sympathizers, yes. Yeah. So it's, this is considered to be immigrants all of a sudden go from being these innocents who need to be taught to dangerous, uh, suspicious people who absolutely need to be watched. They need to be watched, surveilled. And they also still need to be taught, but it's much more coercive. Yeah. So uh, during World War I, then uh, one way to coerce immigrants was to encourage them to buy liberty bonds. And I have a slide there on liberty bonds. Um, and so, the, yeah, there's, there it is. Are you 100% American? Prove it. <clears throat> so interesting, the onus is on the immigrants. <laughs> you must buy liberty bonds in order to prove that you're a patriotic American. <laughs> so, so uh, this you must go fight in the 442nd well, a few years you, later you, to prove you're a patriotic <laughs> American. <laughs> you know, this is, this is what is happening with immigration. So, so what happens then is this Americanization movement becomes coercive. And by 1917, the Congress has decided, you know, enough with this immigration. They pass a law restricting immigration. They pass another law in 1921, further restricting that's, immigration. That's McCarran Walters. That's right, and they put in the quota system, uh -huh. where a very small percentage of the population of these countries can actually uh, become uh, immigrants. But it, it's, it's really, this reaction becomes quite violent, especially against German Americans during World War I. Uh, there's this farmer in, in uh, Minnesota, a German-American, first generation, and, and some people come up to him and say, you want to buy Liberty Bonds? He says, oh, no, no, I'm not going to buy Liberty Bonds. They tar and feather him. There are German immigrants attacked all over the country. Some lynchings take place. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's a very serious uh, counter-reaction. So you have the 1921 law. And then in 1924, this anti-immigrant feeling is extended to the Japanese and all other Asians. Uh, the Asian exclusion law is passed in 1924. And that means that no Asians can come to the United States. Zero. Zero. 
and it that's, creates that's worse than McCarran Walters. It, it for creates sure. a very, very bad blood between the United States and Japan, especially. Yeah, um, but we certainly, we certainly made some mistakes there. But it was it sounds to me like it was a consequence of having a lot of immigrants come. People mm, envy them for their their vitality. Uh, and uh, are threatened by the fact they might take jobs. Yeah. Um, and the mm -hmm. war comes, and all of a sudden we have the, what do you call it, jingoism, right? Everybody wants to be America first. You, where have I heard that recently? Yeah. <laughs> um, America first, and we exclude everybody who's yeah. not like us. It's yeah. tribalism yeah, that, in the yes, 20th century. That's, that's a good term for it, and that's a term that pundits use to criticize it, that America had gone tribal. And it does, in a way, go tribal. And um, it becomes this, there's a very just a very strong virulent anti-immigrant feeling in the United States, and of course the Ku Klux Klan. I've got a picture of the the Klan here marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, wow. 1926. Wow! Wow! Hoods un, unmasked. Oh! They're unafraid. They're unabashed. The Klan at this time period probably has six million members to it. The Klan had become anti-immigrant. And they, and they rode in on that coattail. We talked about this, didn't we? That's they right. They had gone dormant around yes. 1900, yes. but then... They, 1915, they, they take this anti-immigrant feeling and they run with it and they, they become very large, a very uh, big organization at that point. So, so these decades before World War II, there's this just very strong anti-immigrant feeling. Uh, and of course, in some ways, a culmination of it is the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Now, there were actually internment camps for German Americans in World War I. A few German Americans were actually interned. Uh, so it's not the first time it happened in mm -hmm. World War II, but uh, it's the largest number. So, you know, many thousands of Japanese Americans were interned, uh, 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 you know, in, in World War II. So, this is kind of a culmination of that anti-immigrant feeling that you simply can't trust these alien people. They're not real Americans. So what? You know, this is this is a great country. I'd like to I, <laughs> I hold on to that. And uh, you know, certainly uh, the end of the 19th century was troublesome because we had the yeah. robber barons and yeah. and we dump on the immigrants, we dump on the poor. And I remember, you know, to me the big change of direction was the triangle shirtwaist uh, yeah. fire yeah. because they were all immigrants not only uh, you know Jewish uh, Italian right. Irish they were all right. there all right. getting burned up because nobody respected them yeah. and they you know abused them and uh, yeah. and uh, exploited them and so forth and that changed things because the press got involved and the courts got involved and yep. before you know it people people had a different attitude about it yep. but until that moment you know this country was dumping on immigrants. Now, what is in the national, the national psyche that lets us, you know, be so vital and so innovative and so yeah. in manifest destiny, if you will, but at the same time dump on people who have come here uh, for the Statue of Liberty? Well, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's a, a number of things. Um, you know, uh, in in that early 20th century time period, then it's it, it's part of it's a question of uh, we don't understand their cultures; they're very different from us, and so why should we tolerate them? The truth is, in this time period, racism and ethnocentrism are at an all-time high in the United States. So, it's really actually more a piece of a a larger framework of 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 American attitudes. Uh, to not tolerate people who are not like you, and color is a big issue, and uh, you know religion is a big issue. Catholics are not well tolerated. You know it's a Protestant country, uh, and you know the the Pope is considered to be a very corrupt guy. So, so it's it's. Um, I, I think, you know, you, I think your question is, you know, how can a country so committed to equality and liberty? And freedom. How can this kind of a, this country actually go down that road? And the truth is, it was never quite the commitment. Um, we had slavery. We started with slavery. Right. Uh, so there were always All contradictions. All men created equally, yeah. and then we got eighty years, uh, ninety right. years. Right. So, slavery. so, so there's there were always contradictions in this idea. I think this, in some ways, maybe we can see the United States as a work in progress. Uh, for all of these years, uh, a, a kind of a becoming 
of a, a nation of freedom. Now, I would say that uh, in the civil rights movement from the 1950s and then into the 1960s and onward, we've much more embraced that idea of freedom and emancipation and uh, uh, civil rights for all. And we've, we've become a much more tolerant society, I think, than we were. So, so you know, present-day anti-immigrant attitudes are probably in some ways a reaction. They're a reaction, of course, against Muslim, Muslim immigrants and terror, you know, mm -hmm. this fear about terror. There's certainly that. But there is also a, a counter movement to more civil rights, to more freedoms, freedoms for more groups, freedoms for, you know, for gays and lesbians, people with disabilities. So, so there's, a, a, there's been this tremendous opening up of freedom and this tremendous uh, a new awareness of that freedom, of of who has freedom and who doesn't, and why we all should share in that this, freedom. This is during our lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. You and me, John, and and uh, I saw this coming up in what the 50s, the 60s. The 60s was a renaissance of some kind. Yeah. And the 70s, and you know, I mean, it was up and down, but basically yeah. it was good. Yeah. All of a sudden, Trump, and and the people who elected him. And this, the old time, the old time story is coming back again. How yeah. do you explain that? Well, again, I think it's still a battle. I think it's a battle between those who value freedom and those who are afraid of, of threats. Uh, it's, it's not that no one in the anti-immigrant movement values freedom, but they differentiate their freedom from the freedom of others. Um, it's still a becoming nation. Uh, I think we're, we're going to continue to see these kinds of battles for a long time, um, depending upon how history goes and, and how uh, the, the kind of the, the third, maybe the third wave of civil rights is coming now with, a, with an African-American president, and certainly you see uh, the success of Trump being a reaction against that African-American presidency. So we probably need a third reconstruction. You know, the first reconstruction failed. The second reconstruction in the, in the civil rights move era of the 1960s was fairly successful. Maybe we need a third reconstruction mm. to, to, to further push forward this project. It's not gonna be complete. I firmly believe that it won't be complete for a long time. Somehow we've fallen behind other countries who got the message from us yeah. and rode yeah. that horse, and then, <laughs> and then ironically, we, yes. we fell off the horse. Yes. So what does immigration yes. reform look like? What does immigration, the new immigration mentality and right. legislation right. look like, say, in the next five or ten years? What well, think? It, I, I think it really depends. It looks to me like the DACA folks are, are going to get they're, they're going to get folded in, so they're going to be okay. Um, there's going to be an attempt to limit immigration. Uh, there's going to be an attempt to move immigration from family-oriented immigration to skill-based immigration. Like Canada. That, Canada has that. that that's correct. And, there, and there's going to be an attempt to, uh, to basically exclude uh, Middle Eastern peoples completely. Um, and, you know, if that's where, if, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the baseline of anti-immigrant feeling is when you, when you look at an anti-immigrant person, they probably distrust Muslims more than anything else. So, so uh, Trump, in order to appeal to that group. Now, these are proposals. Who knows if they'll get passed? I think Democrats are going to resist this mightily because Democrats are on the other side. They're emancipationists. Mm -hmm. And they'll lose. We don't, you know, the Democrats don't want to lose their political base in the immigrant communities. So they're going to fight pretty hard against this. The Republicans will have to have every vote they can get in order to pass a, a significantly more restrictive immigration law. What's ironic, we only have a minute left yeah. here, but I'm interested in your thought about this. What's ironic is it's not just the old white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who, who call for this anti-immigration policy. Many of the people who call for this anti-immigration policy have come from immigrant families themselves. Have they no memories? Shall they relive mm. history mm. without a memory? Mm. It's the old Santayana story. Yeah, yeah. Well, but the, the, the thing is, even those immigrants, the, the Archie Bunker immigrants, right? Well, they, they, they took their values with, and their values back in their home countries were not particularly open to others. And so they, they brought a mix of, you know, closed value, values about immigrants. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you become a second-generation immigrant, then you're, I guess, these, these folks consider that they're no longer immigrants, you know. And, but 
Americans love to talk about their immigrant past, not about letting new immigrants then in. Somebody else's immigrant. That's right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Sure. John David Dan, history professor at HBU. You Thank bet. you so much for you coming bet. down.